Check, check, check. All right. Ready? Good evening and welcome to UN50 Real Discussion, a virtual town hall to continue open dialogue regarding race relations within our community and to embrace and promote the positive interaction Wayne County has experienced throughout recent national events. My name is Carol Bowden. I'm the clerk of the Board of Wayne County Commissioners and Director of Public Affairs. Tonight's virtual town hall is designed to be interactive. We want you to participate. If you have a question or a comment for our guest speakers, please leave it in the chat box on Facebook. The time for some house rules. Profanity, race, racist comments, derogatory remarks will not be tolerated. Please keep your comments respectful, positive, and in a contributing manner. I'm going to introduce you to our guests. Uh, these are our guest panelists tonight, and uh, we thank them very much for participating in this first time ever virtual town hall for Wayne County. First, we have Sheriff Larry Pierce. He's been the Wayne County, he's been, he is a native of Wayne County and been the sheriff since 2014. His career in law enforcement began with the city of Goldsboro and included a stint with the North Carolina SBI. In addition to uh, law, Sheriff Pierce has been a dedicated volunteer fireman, arson investigator, and he and his family continue a big business that was begun by his father, Nana Pork. Just had to throw that in there, Sheriff. Hope that was okay. Uh, Chief West, he's a Goldsboro native. He's 28 years with the Goldsboro Police Department, including over four years as chief and interim chief before that. He's a certified trash traffic crash reconstructionist, field sobriety instructor, and a general instructor. He supervises the department's Governor's Highway Safety Program, and their traffic unit was ranked number one in the state for six consecutive years. Uh, welcome, Chief West. We have Beverly B.J. Council, the founder of UN50. She retired as Deputy Police Chief from Durham, and that's the Durham Police Department. Uh, she set some first in Durham and believes in addressing community issues by implementing solutions through collaboration with those directly impacted in affected neighborhoods. BJ believes that communication and understanding others' perspectives is imperative when building the community's trust. And we're going to let her talk to you a little bit more about you and 5 later. It's one of the most amazing programs I've ever in my life had the opportunity to learn about. Judge Erica James, District Court Judge for the 8th Judicial District of North Carolina. That includes Wayne, Lenore, and Greene Counties. Judge James is a certified juvenile court judge and presides over juvenile family, criminal, domestic, violence, and involuntary commitment courts. She is the first African-American woman to ever sit on the District Court in the 8th Judicial District. And we welcome you, Judge. Colleen Kaczynski is a district administrator for the Guardian Ad Litem program for the 8th District Court. This program protects the best interest of abused and neglected children who have come into the court for protection. Um, Colleen has worked with children in this district for the past 34 years. That's just unbelievable. And she dreams of a day when every child has the opportunity to grow up safe, happy, loved, and protected. Colleen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, do we have Pastor Nick Whirl? Hey. There he is. Pastor Nick, thank you so much. A native of Wayne County, he's married to Candy Whirl, a graduate of uh, NC Central University. He was instrumental in the recent positive and peaceful rallies in Goldsboro. Pastor Whirl became a minister in 2003, a pastor in 2008 with one church, and the name of his church represents his outlook on life. We're all one. And finally, last but not least, that smiling face over there, Linnea Foster. She's the uh, grant writer for the strategic plan to reduce disproportionate minority contact for youth in Goldsboro. She's CEO of Southeast Community Resources. The grant, which was awarded to the Goldsboro Police Department, will allow implementation of a program that's currently being used in Lenore County. And we'll discuss that in length later in the program. So we're going to jump into it, and um, Pastor Nick, you were uh, not here in the very beginning when we talked about it, so I just want to share with you that 
in the event that you there's a delay, you don't hear someone, we may moderate and say, hold up, we're going to let someone else finish. We don't want to talk over each other because we want everyone in our audience to hear everything that you have to say in the dialogue that we're excited is, is about to happen. So we're going to go ahead and start with the reality from the senseless deaths of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery to the removal of statues across our nation. Racial tension has exploded across the country, but our Wayne County community chose to gather and rally in peaceful, positive ways. Many other cities saw riots and destruction, and we're going to start off with the first question uh, that we want to continue the positivity and the real conversation. So, Judge James, I'm going to start with you, and then Pastor Nick, I want you to follow. Why do you think Goldsboro and Wayne County residents kept the rallies peaceful and positive? Uh, well, I don't know that I can answer that question um, because to do so would put me in the position of answering and speaking for someone else. I can say that I'm happy that it did go off peacefully. Um, and um, I would imagine that um, all of the protesters uh, intended to um, protest pe peacefully and exercise their constitutional uh, rights to do so. And I don't believe that anybody um, sets out to exercise um, their constitutional rights and engage in the political process with the frame of reference that this is gonna be something violent. Um, and I, I would imagine that that probably had a lot to do with it from the outset, that um, the intentions were good and um, it in fact bore out um, to demonstrate just that. Thank you, Judge James. Mm -hmm. Pastor Dick? I believe that one of the reasons why it was peaceful um, was because uh, we as a city, uh, we as a group of people, collective body group of people, uh, I believe that our demographics of people are just different. Um, I've traveled all over North Carolina, I've traveled all over um, this country, and there's something about Wayne County um, that speaks toward the respect of one another. Now, of course, we have pockets of, you know, issues like any other city, but overall, there's a different, we just have a different feel. Um, and I believe that's one of the reasons why um, we have not seen the violence in um, demonstrations and in protests. And that's my opinion. Thank you, Pastor Nick. I, I think I like that answer a lot. I like what both of you had to say. All right, Sheriff Pierce and uh, Chief West, I'm going to direct this next question to both of you. And Sheriff, I'll let you go first, and Chief, let you follow. So your officers are trained and sworn to treat everyone the same, and your departments promote that every single day here in Wayne County. But how have recent events affected or affected the men and women to who serve with you, and how's it affected each one of you? There are recent events that have caused us to survey our policies. Um, we are constantly training in a way that we hope would uh, be consistent with uh, treating everyone fairly, but. Uh, that our officers are sort of on edge now all the time. Uh, it does sort of give us a uneasy feeling because of all the rioting and all that have that have been displayed throughout the United States. However, I agree with the pastor. Uh, we we are trying to look at everyone here in a individual way, and the, that uh, everybody, if they'll take their responsibility seriously. We take our responsibility seriously, um, and we sort of comply now and complain later, as I think uh, you and 5-0, that phrase from uh, BJ, uh, is a good way of looking at things. But we try our best to uh, look at our surroundings and, and treat people as should be treated. Thank you, Sheriff. Chief? Mm 
you're muted, Chief. How's this? There we go. Technology, it's great. Um, I think as a department as a whole, we were, we were disheartened um, with the events that happened with George Floyd. Um, concerned about how the community, because it's, and this is a classic case of, you know, you've got that apple that's attacked at Adam. We're all, as a law enforcement entity, we're going to pay the price. Um, so we, were, we were very uh, concerned about the way the community was going to react. Uh, we were disheartened, spoke with the officers a whole lot. Um, once the testing started, we, you know, we had a decision to make. We could come out kind of strong and maybe forceful protest and, and try to limit it. We could come out, let's do a soft approach, and let's see how the protests evolve. And fortunately, we've got a great community, very supportive community, and it was the, the, the protesting itself. You had some bad apples that tried to get it out of control. They, the protesters themselves brought it back in. They were doing the policing of the group. Uh, and the officers were very thankful for that. We had a lot of engagement with, with the public. And when we walked away from it afterwards, the officers truly understood that the community policing, the outreach that we're doing, um, and they felt the support from the community, but they also understand that that support can go away pretty quickly. Um, and, and again, you know, like Sheriff said, you know, we constantly review our policies and look the way we can improve and take something away from what has taken place and to provide better services. So. Thank you very much, Chief. Would any of you like to comment about their response to this question? All right, let's move along then. BJ, your program, you and 5 teaches comply, then complain. And the sheriff just talked about it. And I uh, want you to explain a little further what that means. Um, and then I want you to address the fear and perhaps even anger that sometimes goes along with that directive, comply, then complain. Because sometimes um, stories that I've heard is that complying doesn't always answer the question for them, doesn't always make it safe feeling for them. So let's talk about that, BJ, if you will. Basically what we want, we want everybody to go home, to include law enforcement. Everybody needs to go to the house. That's their primary goal. And comply, complain. I get what you're saying. One of the things that I got pushed back on after George Floyd was he was complying. He, he could not have complied more than anything else. Uh, but the bottom line is more often than not, resisting may end up. So I'm going to stick with my comply and complain that it, it's going to work more often than not. Statistics are going to show that if you comply, you're going to go home. You're going to go home. And what we try to do is reduce the uh, likelihood of you uh, being injured or arrested or killed and give you this information so that, that you can, can get home. We want to increase the likelihood you go home. Um, I understand that people are angry, um, and we allow for that during our presentation. This, this is traumatic, a lot going on in this moment, and black folks are angry. So we allow for them to process that. Uh, we give them that space to allow that to come out. And we have law enforcement in the room to help them with that conversation. Of course, we get to hear how the community feels about them to create dialogue. And hopefully, conversations go. So it's a difficult conversation. I've already talked to Chief West, and he's, he's ready to have those difficult conversations and uncomfortable conversations. And that's the only way we're going to be able to move forward. So that's kind of a little bit of what, what we want to try to do here in the. Now we're going to get into some of the uh, hardcore questions. And, um, you know, I, I just want to go ahead and say that we knew all of us going into this, everybody across our state, across our nation knows this is uncomfortable. But that's what we're trying to get beyond. So here we go. Racial tensions often build and ignite over a black victim versus a white perpetrator. But why is it a black and white issue? when other ethnicities are often victims as well. Who wants to take that on? 
<laughs> Go ahead, Pastor Nick. That's that's a um, that that is so that is a, a very complex question. Um, I believe that has uh, many different parts to it. Um, so it's kind of it would take a while to address all of the different reasons of why and all of the different reasons why both parties have a a serious um, and a truthful side to this systemic issue. I believe that African, Amer Af African Americans have a serious um, uh, a serious side to this. I also believe that the police officers have a serious and truthful side to this. Um, so it's very complex. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. It's very complex. Very complex. But both sides have a very good argument. Um, yeah, both sides have a very good argument. Does anybody else want to weigh Carol, in on can that? I answer that? Um, I just feel like we've gotten to a point in some times where there's just not respect for each other, you know, and to me, that's what it comes down to. You know, I respect you, you respect me. Um, it shouldn't matter for black, white, Asian, you know, Middle Eastern, whatever. It's just a matter of treating each other with kindness and respect would go so much further. But I think everyone has gotten so, um, where we just feel like we need to fight instead of we need to work together. And I think that that's what was so beautiful about what happened here in Wayne County. And thankfully in, in my entire district, Wayne, Lenore and Green, not that I had anything to do with it, but the protests were important, but they were peaceful and started the conversation. Um, you know, I think it's really important that, you know, this grant that we'll talk about in a little bit, we started this well before George Floyd's death, but it has made it that much more important that we do this work. And um, so I just think we get back to a point where we treat each other with respect and try to understand each other. I don't know what it's like to be a Black person. Never been Black. I, I mean, I just, it, I haven't, but... I can try to be an ally and I can try to bring about policies and understanding that at least in my world, you know, the children I serve have an opportunity to grow up healthy and happy, which is what I want. Anybody else? Carol, um, I think it's just a story. It, going to, um, it's the history of law enforcement. You help me segue right in the black into my community. very next question. Oh, I'm sorry, BJ's talking, I could not hear. My apologies, go ahead, BJ. So it's about the history. It's about the history of law enforcement within the black community. And then you, we also need to look at the data as well and the populations between and what that represents. Uh, based on the, the 2016 census, uh, black America makes up 13% of the population, but they're 24% likely getting killed. So that means they're 2.5 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. That's, that's the data. And so then you, get, you have the history, systemic, and all those types of things. So we at least, first thing we've got to do, like, we've got to go ahead and acknowledge the history. And once we start acknowledging the history, we can start moving forward. And that's what this conversation hopefully will begin to do as we do this grant. It also has to do with, we got to just, we have to look at the numbers. It, it, it speaks, and I don't, not saying that that's, these things are going on in Wayne County or Goldsboro, those are things that people are talking about. It's a national conversation, but we have to bring it lower and look at what's going on in your community. I mean, the ages of, of black males between the ages of 15 and 34, uh, based on some data, are they account for 15% of the uh, deaths in 2015 by, the, by, by officers, but they only represent 2% of the population. So when you start looking at those numbers, people get angry with that information. And so we've got to have this conversation. And, and like you said, Carol, it's going to be uncomfortable. And when law enforcement is in the room and at least acknowledging this and saying, yes, we get that, and then we can move forward. So we've got to, we've got to talk about the history 
acknowledge the history and figure out how we're going to go. Thank you, DJ. You guys are going to help me um, segue or have helped me segue a little bit into the next question. Um, I get what BJ is saying about acknowledging the history. Um, I get what Colleen is saying, and I certainly understand, Pastor Nick, you're right. There's so many different aspects to the question that I asked and so many different directions that we can go in. But let's talk a little bit about something that no matter how hard we work, we're not going to be able to erase. And I think it plays a factor into this, and this is where I want you guys to weigh in. It's not always a racial issue. Sometimes it's good versus evil. Right? Define good versus evil. I mean, I'm not really, what do you mean by good versus evil? What, what does that mean? Okay. Jill's having to help me with, with yours, uh, BJ, because I cannot hear you for some reason through the monitor. Um, you know, Good cops, good citizens, okay? I consider, oops, I hit my microphone. I consider myself a good citizen. I'm not gonna walk up and put a gun to a five-year-old's head for no reason. Um, I have family members that are in law enforcement. They're good, they're good people. And they're not going to put their knee on somebody's neck for nearly nine minutes unnecessarily. That's good. And the other situations that I described are evil. Um, but they've turned into racial issues because for some reason we just can't get past seeing color over seeing people. I think Chief West might have said something. I think also uh, Sheriff said something that what they've been doing during this moment is that they're looking at, they're looking inward the policy and holding their office accountable, making sure that policies and procedures are doing what it needs to do to make sure they're being professional and they're treating everybody fairly or as full as they can in the community. As far as, you know, making sure they've got things that in place internally as far as their agency is we both said doing just this brief moment so that that that's a good thing to make sure that when you look at chief west you can say so what are you doing to make sure your officers are interacting professionally with everybody in this community what does that look like policy wise what does that look like training wise and then as far as individuals in the community we just have to figure out you know what is it that's going on with this individual you know that could be causing this individual to behave the way he or she is behaving sometimes it's just not necessarily i don't think you can just boil it down to being evil i mean the one out of four inter interaction with law enforcement the person has some type of mental health issue you know so that that's an issue that's not that lays at the door a step of law enforcement but that but that's not their role you know, so what, what are the, like Colleen, what, what are those judicial systems doing to help move these individuals along? So, so you know, when you say good and evil, I kind of have to kind of pause on that. I think it's looking at individuals, looking at systems, looking at how people are in positions that they're in. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of where, for me, it's bigger, I don't want to say it's bigger than good and evil, but it's just a bigger discussion than simply someone being evil. We got to look a little more through that person's journey, at least that is. Thank you, DJ. And and I think I think there has been um, negative misperceptions. Um, I would say uh, there's been negative. There has been, and I'm not just talking about in Wayne County. I'm just talking about across the board. There, but there has been negative misperceptions about African American men that automatically African American men are combative, are you know, to way in the words of the streets call it turned up, ready to fight. You know, angry men who are ready to just 
um, go after police and kill police and those type of things, which are so far from the truth. So I think a lot of times, let's just be honest, let's just put it on the table. I think sometimes when they roll up on a, on a, in an environment where there are African-American men per se, I believe, and I believe that there are police officers who are already defensive, who are already at a, you know, already combative and already ready um, to engage with the African-American man. Some part of it, like I shared earlier, some part of, all of it is on African-American men, but a lot of it, I believe, is the misperception, misconception, is the thought process of when I'm rolling up on an African-American situation, an African-American man, you know, he fits the prototype, and all of a sudden, so there's a defense mechanism that comes up that I feel like we we may need to revisit that we may need to because I, I don't I know for a fact that that every African American man is not out to kill police um, that many of us are compliant many are you know um, want to listen but I think through the years there has been a a miscommunication between the African American man and the police officer um, so. That's what I'm gonna put on the table. Um, so, so the so so that's why I'm saying the, the conversation is so it's so it's so much deeper than just you know black and white, cut and dry. There's so many different systematic systemic issues. You know what I mean? I think that's Anybody why if we don't start exploring what our implicit biases are, we're never going to get anywhere. Absolutely. And so I think that that's just really critical and something that what I'm sensing is people are willing to do. You know, there is systematic racism. We know that. We need to figure out how we can dismantle that as a community because I don't think any of us want that. I also think that some people are aware of their bias and then some people are not aware of our bias. But if we can do some education, um, we can get to a point where we can have a safer community and you know, bring, bringing in the UM50 with you know, BJ and the comply then complain, all of that, it's just gonna make our community better. Right. I agree. Thank you, Colleen. And again, you guys have um, jumped right into my, my next question, um, profiling. It exists, there's no question. Is it ever justified? And if the answer is no, it's not justified, how do you determine the difference between profiling and being aware of your surroundings, which for your own safety sometimes is, uh, causes you to be judgmental. I'll wait on that one. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. Um, profiling, so to speak, has gotten a bad name, but we have to realize that um, we as law enforcement should not profile by race, by nationality, anything that is specific to any one group of people. However, basically profiling is how law enforcement functions because we have to look at the psychological and behavioral characteristics of people in order to do our job. So profiling itself is not bad. Profiling in certain manners is what's bad. Right. Chief, you want to weigh in on that? Unmute. I'm going to be the only one with this problem. <laughs> I mean, I agree with what the sheriff's saying. You know, profiling, it's, it's, I don't know that it's got a bad rap. I just think the way sometimes it's automatic when you say profiling, it's assumed that that profiling is based on race. Um, but again, like the sheriff said, the characteristics, habits, uh, is what we're looking for. Um, kind of peddling back to what you were saying earlier um, um, about rolling up on scenes and, and having this predetermined notion of what you think is going to happen just because you're going into a black community or going to be dealing with 
you know, black male on a call. Officers are trained to, you know, when you get dispatched to the call, on the way to the call, you're trying to go through different scenarios of how the call could unfold. You know, case scenario, you need to be prepared for this. Best case scenario, you're going to handle it this way. And I don't know that sometimes the officers just get wrapped up in the negative part of it. Of how it's going to go bad when I get there. Um, and, and it's hard for officers to kind of, we've got to be prepared, just like the beginning when we said everybody wants to go home at the end of the day. That's the main goal here. Um, if we could just slow down a bit when we get to these calls and let's see how they're going to unfold instead of showing up and being in the defensive posture of I'm demanding control of this scene, it's, we've got to be able to have some mechanism in place where we can just take that extra step, slow down a little bit, and let's see what's going to happen in this call. We've got to be prepared, but sometimes we may not do a very good job of that. We kind of get ahead of it and make drive it down the wrong road. So training, I think, will help that conversation and and getting out in the community and learning about parts of the community that you know. I, I think that's the key part um, that you said, Chief. I, th I just think it's powerful, and I discussed this um, the other day. Um, one of the reasons why I've been successful in Ghost World as a pastor, and I believe that as a person, is that the relationship piece is so important. That if you don't build relationships when it is a peaceful moment, then what happens is, is that you do not know this person you're rolling up on. And then because you don't know the person, then all of a sudden it becomes something that has no reason to be. But if we build relationships, we go into the neighborhood and build relationships on purpose. We show up one day and just police officers just pass out hot dogs or whatever, just build a relationship in those areas. You'll know those people. So when you hear their name across the, uh, when you get the call or whatever, you'll know, okay, that's Johnny, that's Sue, that's 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 Sandy. Because, you know, especially in our city, you know, our city is so small. I mean, we, I mean, you can literally learn pretty much the, the main people that's gonna really you know, cause some issues in our city. So I think that relationship piece is so important. That relationship piece is so important. That's one of the reasons why you know, we, we've been so blessed to go into some areas and just literally walk at midnight to 11 o'clock because we know everybody because we've been in those areas. So if you've been in those areas, you can walk and know that nothing's going to happen to you. And you know you can go up back home because you built that relationship. But if you haven't built that relationship, you're not for sure you're going to make it back home because you don't know who's there. Does that make sense? You're always going to be defensive of a stranger and you are somebody that you know. So yeah. building that relationship piece is very important. Yeah, and the worst time to try to build a relationship is, from an officer standpoint, is if I'm on a call for service, that's not necessary. I don't need to be building relationships when I'm in the, the call itself. I need to be building relationships in between the call for service. Absolutely. Not out in the community, not just when I get a call to be there. Absolutely. It's the same thing with me as in the classroom as a teacher. You know what I mean? Like, we're going to build relationships from the first 10 days don't need for me to build a relationship when Johnny's in the in in the office and he's done got in trouble. You know, my my part my part is to build a relationship with Johnny before he gets to that point, so I can be able to diffuse anything that's going on. And because he's had a relationship with me, he's going to be diffused from the situation because he knows me. To say, hey, Mister Where I ain't gonna ain't gonna ain't gonna act up today because I I know you, and so that rapport causes people to pipe down or calm down because of the relationship that you've built with the people. If I've never built a relationship, then it's going to be some problems. West, um, we had a question, a follow-up question for you on this. How do we ensure or how do you ensure that all officers receive that training? Train, training for us, obviously we can reach out. Training costs money. Part of our budget have to spend, you know, for the training. Where we struggle with some of our training is I've got to pull officers off the street to go attend training. Uh, and if I've got manpower issues where I can't adequately staff a shift, sometimes it's hard for me to get training in there. Uh, also, the way we're structured training sometimes when I send officers off site to take training, um, I can only send two officers at a time. Some classes have only got two seats available per department. So it could take me up to a year to get the whole department trained in whatever we're trying to train in. Um, 
and and also go along with all the in, mandatory in service. So, um, but it's 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 recognizing from communicating with the community, uh, outreach in the community, um, talking with all the law enforcement agency, kind of paying attention. And, and I made the comment earlier uh, in a previous conversation is when I'm in groups, I don't do a whole lot of talking. I do a lot of listening because I learn more by listening of what. What, what the topic is, and I can kind of make my notes of where I think I need to be going with the department and make a decision. Um, but, but yeah, the training is, is, it's difficult for us just because of the manpower and being able to get everybody trained in. And, uh, but yeah, it's just no, no training when you talking with the officers. The officers will give you some good information that give you the opportunity to talk to them and let them provide input on what training they need in the community to help them do their job every day. Um, so communicating with the officers, uh, the public, um, talking with other agencies and see kind of what the training is, what training is important, and, and just following through with it. Thank you, Chief. Judge James, I'm going to uh, throw one back at you for just a moment. And um, the reason why is, you know, you're a judge. When things come to court, you're supposed to present the information. Decisions are made in the courtroom. That's the way law is supposed to work. But unfortunately, in today's world, social media and mainstream media uh, play judge and jury way too often. How does that affect you uh, as a district court judge, and how do you think it affects racial tension in the nation or just in our community? Well, I think that um, social media and um, things of that nature have certainly had the ability to change um, the way cases are presented because many times people come into court with preconceived notions, which is why it's so important that, for instance, um, in a jury trial, when you're picking a jury, you've got to try to, um, during the voir dire process, um, ensure that you're going to get people who agree to make decisions based on the facts that are before them and not things that they've learned through social media. And the same is um, for myself as a district court judge, we typically do bench trials. And so um, the biggest challenge I have is um, litigants who come into court who want to talk about what has happened on Facebook, for instance. Um, but as a trier of fact for myself personally, um, I'm required to base my decision on the evidence that's before me. And so um, from that perspective, I, you know, I'm trained to compartmentalize and separate that. And uh, our voir dire process in, the, um, in our courts is designed to um, do that as well, but it definitely is a problem. Uh, and it's, it's a challenge, it's a challenge every day. Uh, but um, something you had asked earlier when you talked about um, you know, sometimes isn't this just a matter of good versus evil? I kind of um, take issue with that because uh, it's that is um, way oversimplifying an issue. And for instance, um, let's say you got 50 good people, 50 good black people in a room and 50 good white people in a room. And um, you ask the question, how many of you smoke marijuana? Statistically speaking, slightly more white hands should go up than black hands. And if you ask that same group of good people, raise your hand if you've ever been um, arrested for smoking marijuana or charged with smoking marijuana, twice as many black hands will go up as white hands. If you ask that same group of people, how many of you have actually been convicted of smoking or possessing marijuana? Again, you're gonna get about three to four times more black hands will go up than white hands. And finally, let's just say you ask that same group of people, how many of you have actually been put in jail because of smoking or possessing marijuana? Now you're gonna get about six times more black hands go up than white hands, but we started out statistically, more white folks smoke marijuana than black. It's not just about good and evil because everybody in that group, they're good folk. 
And let's just say that all of the police who interacted with them, well, they're good folk too. It's not just about black and white. It's not about good and evil. Um, we're complicated people, we're a complicated society, and we've got a complicated history. And until we come to grips with that and really, truly, honestly deal with it, we're going to continue to see these kinds of issues. But I agree with everyone who initially talked about, I think, in response to your first question, you know, we've got a, a good community here. And um, the fact that all of us are here part of this, um, this Zoom meeting is an indication uh, of the uh, people who are invested in this community. And um, I think um, that's a good thing. So I just wanted to add that um, piece. Thank you. Thank Carol, you. Carol, is this being edited? Is this, being, is this live on Facebook? Yes, sir, we're live. Okay, awesome. Yes, sir, we are. And- um, under, under what page? Wayne County Government. Okay, gotcha. Cool. Erica, you did exactly what I hoped would happen tonight is that's that's the real information that needs to get out. And so I thank you very much. And um, we'll continue on unless anybody else has any more comments on this at this point. A um, couple of other questions that I have, but I think what I want to do right now is Linnea, I want you to talk about the red dmc project what's going on in kinston and what you're going to be bringing here to goldsboro and then we'll do some other questions after that if you don't mind okay thank you for having me uh so i guess i would like to actually follow up a little bit about what uh, uh judge james and the question that you shared a little earlier was uh, i think we all have to be really careful and aware of the language that we use um, when we talk about people, when we talk about labels that we put on people like good and evil, um, they have a long-term effect um, and that it plays out over and over and over again for years to come with labels. And, and I think um, to kind of take it into the, the grant and the DMC Red project, that what we find is, is that those labels end up following young people into their adulthood. And uh, they end up having uh, a long-term relationship with law enforcement and the criminal justice system that ends up having um, consequences, not only for them, but for their families and for the communities that they live in. So it's really important that we, and through this project and through um, just getting out and spreading the word is that labels really do hurt people <laughs> they really do have consequences and uh, uh simplifying a conversation to good versus evil or um this person is good or this person is bad it makes it so that um, people don't end up in circumstances and things happen very fast and decisions get made that can have long-term consequences for um, communities and families for many, many years to come. To come. Uh, so anyway, uh, our project, which I'm very, very grateful that um, <laughs> the city of Goldsboro and the Wayne County are um, leading the efforts in uh, doing a disproportionate minority contact, that's DMT, and racial ethnic disparities, um, research and uh, uh, evaluation of your community and how you engage law enforcement with young people. So what we're going to do um, for a year is we're going to actually do an evaluation of data and the data is going to give us a chance to see how um, those interactions happen, what, what starts them and uh, what happens as a result of those interactions. And, uh, and then we'll create a plan of how to reduce some of those interactions. And we'll do it uh, to address the data, to address the, um, the consequences of those interactions and hopefully divert young people if they can be diverted. Hopefully we'll be able to prevent some of those unnecessary interactions in the future and, um, and hopefully address some of those um, long-term systemic race, racism and 
issues like that that are continuing to not only affect Goldsboro Green, but affecting almost every community across the country. Pauline, tell me what this program means to you and Guardian Ad Litem. Well, I'm really fortunate to be able to be a part of the Lenore County part of this first. And so I've seen what it can do. And it does exactly what I want it to do for the children of our community. Um, it helps shine a light on an issue that's uncomfortable to talk about, but needs to be addressed. Um, and Lenore, um, the um, Kinston Police Department was really brave because they let people from the outside come in, just like Wayne County and the city of Goldsboro are going to do, to look at you know, kind of how they do things to maybe come up with things and better ways to do things. But also what was part of this project was um, some education. We did community sessions that have been really wonderful to again, help people um, understand implicit bias and systemic racism and get some of those um, discussions started. We've done the community engagement with UM50. That's how I got involved with this, was um, my first session with the UM50. I was like, look, I was like, we got to get this to every person in our community. And, you know, I feel that way for Wayne County. Um, we've already seen um, what Pastor mentioned about building community. After the first year, one of the comments that really stuck with me was when the housing authority talked about how the police department had changed their practices and now we're in the housing authority for good reasons instead of always there to break up fights and arrest people. And kids were starting to tell the housing uh, manager that they look at police in a different way. If we can just have that as an outcome, that is going to be huge and monumental. If we can just get people thinking that different way. So it it, to me, is so important from Guardian Lightham's perspective because I'm really tired of kids coming into the system. We have far more black and brown kids than we do white kids. And I want to make sure that every kid gets the opportunities they deserve. And this program will help with that. Thank you, Colleen. One of the questions that... Um somebody viewing right now has asked is racism is not inherited it's taught and or developed how can we change that we can come I, back I to think, it if you want to think about it <laughs> okay pastor I, I think what is in a person's dna will be taught to the person in the in the next generation. So what a person is, is what a person is gonna teach. So then therefore, when you're talking about stopping that racism, um, it's not gonna stop when the person that controls the household is built in their DNA. They're automatically gonna teach that they're going to hang around other people who are going to teach that. They're going to hang around. They're going to be placed in environments that teach that. So unless we change the head of the household's thinking, which we've seen over time that does not work properly, then we're not going to change the mentality of the people. All we have to do is um, just continue to be who we are because that is not going to change because a person's DNA, how they were raised, how they feel about another person is how they feel about another person. And there's nothing that, there's nobody on this live or in the world period that can change that except for God. Does that make sense? So if it's in a person's DNA, it's, they're going to teach their children the same thing if it's in them. You know, and so that's the sad part about it is that it isn't something that children are born with because I've seen my son literally at five years old go to the McDonald's Playhouse or playground and play with everybody there. Same thing with white children, right? But if it's been instilled in them at home, continue to be instilled in them at home, then what will happen is one day they realize 
he's different than me. Because he's different than me, I can't hang out with him. And that, to me, is a crime all in itself. Staying along that train of thought, Pastor Nick, would you say that that's also the same structure in families where there's a a fear of law enforcement, though there's never been interaction for there to be fear? Um, I, I think I, I think to a certain extent, I believe that certain households, certain households, to be honest, teach to respect uh, those in authority. Uh, I know we teach our son and and and. There are others in the African-American community um, that teach respect officers. Um, but the thing is, you can't, we can't stop what we have seen over the years. So if I've seen something over the years in the TV, in the media, in the music, you know, if I've seen those type of things and they're innately a part of my makeup of who I am, then that's an issue that's outside of how I'm raised. Does that make sense? So it's because I've seen it so much in the TV. You know what I'm saying? I've seen it so much in the music. It has now become a part of me that I'm already I'm already defensive because of all the things in the media that has taught me to be on the defensive. And rightly so, because as an African American male, let's be honest, I have to teach I have to teach my son different on how to interact with police officers than it would be an average man or every or, or average white man or white son. So I teach different, you know, so we want you to come home, be respectful as possible, listen, and just pray that, that nothing happens to you. That's how I have to teach my son, right? Which is different than some other people because they don't even have to have that conversation. But what is upsetting to me is I have to have that conversation weekly with my son. How do you deal with police officers? How do you deal with, you know, different people? Because this is what we've seen. You know, when you ask the question, that what happened and what happened to Mr. Floyd? You have to tell that story. You have to you have to be honest about the story and say, hey, it could happen to you. And uh that's fearful. That's that's scary. So as a father, I have to teach him that. So it is it hits different. It's different. All right, yeah. Sheriff and Chief, I want to. Oh, Sheriff was talking. Okay, go ahead. Good. That's what I want. To piggyback off what the pastor was saying, it, it is so important, and and race does play a part. But we're seeing across all racial lines a disrespect now, for, yes. and that's what bothers me. It's uh, if you go into the school system the respect we have for teachers now or the disrespect it's across the board across the local lines that that's what really concerns me and as the pastor mentioned a while ago and maybe only god can change what we're seeing right now and i am based in a lot of my belief what i believe and we do need to get back to the community as a faith based and that's what's going to make a difference i think right absolutely absolutely it's a respect and it's a respect thing. It's a knowledge thing as well, though. It's knowledge. It's being taught. How do you deal? How do you diffuse situations? How do you, you know, how do you live so that you can come, like, like uh, she said, how do you go come back home? You know what I mean? That's, that's rough. Can I chime in? Um, so I appreciate what both of you all are saying. And uh, I, I'm... I think it's good to have the dialogue, but what I see when I see racism and when I see when I see people um, that are disconnected is that we need to reconnect. That the idea that kids feel like they don't have to respect their elders is because there's a lack of relationship. And we need to start bringing that relationship back into the forefront. I also think that um, that when we see racism, we see a lack of education. Um, and that we need to prioritize education and cultural awareness and cultural competency. That we all spend a lot of time learning 
about different groups of people or we we know what some people like to eat <laughs> we love what other people like to dance what kind of music they like but then other people we didn't have to spend as much time learning about but we still interact with them and i think that, um as our as you grow and as communities become more diverse and as you have to learn about new things we also need to t- make sure that we don't take for granted the relationships that we think we know. And uh, I think there's a lot of things about Black people that some people just frankly don't know and have never felt comfortable asking the questions. I've never felt comfortable even saying the word Black. Like saying the word Black and just be like, it could shut down a room, right? <laughs> Did I just shut the room down just by saying it? But it's important that people get to the point where you can say, you know, we have a lot of black boys that are just not connected. What can we do about that? And it's okay to just say it and then do something about it. Linnea, thank you very much. Anybody else want to wait? Chief, did you want to weigh in or is everybody good? No, I, I, I to say something about what you just said about um, that kids raised in a household and, and that's just part of the DNA. I kind of push back on that a little bit. That doesn't necessarily Can you bring it true. To, like literally just bring uh, it, it, to it, it doesn't really, I may be raised in a household, but if I'm exposed to different things, I am aware of individuals who are white who were raised in a household that was prejudiced, but they didn't come out. That, that's not, they came into the world, they, they moved into the space, they're, they diversified uh, the people that they moved around. And so they, they were able to realize that that's not the thing they wanted to follow that they were taught. In that. So mm-hmm. I think it has to do with, you know, what, what's inside them and, the, and school and being educated and being exposed to things outside and saying, oh, you know what, that's not exactly cool you know, for my parents to be that because everybody doesn't, I don't have to really believe in that. So just saying that, and then you're right, it's the talk that everybody has around the conversation with the black, black family. They have that talk about it with law enforcement. It's that journey. I have a white female friend that says what she was taught to do when she got pulled over was to start crying. That's what she was told to do as a white female. But for for, for black folks is, you know, don't do this, don't, to, 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 in order to survive that. People don't even think about the fact that black police officers are talking to their black kids while they're in uniform to tell them how to navigate police officers. They're standing in a uniform. I mean, we, we got to think about how this thing is, it's, it's, it's big, it's huge, and how to have those conversations and be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And, and then we can start having more different. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, BJ. Um, so change. We've heard that word a lot tonight. We've heard, um, you know, we've, we've got to acknowledge the history that's there. And I think this group and I think this community is even beginning to get to that point. But how's it going to, how's the change going to happen? What is the change and how does it happen? Go. All right, I'll share. One of my favorite quotes is from James Baldwin, um, activist, you know, just did so many different things. And I keep it in my office. It says, nothing that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And so I think we have to start having these conversations. That's the first step. And that's why I think we're at a very beautiful place to begin um, making some really meaningful changes for the community. So um, I keep that in my office um, along with a few other um, quotes that inspire me, but that one in particular, you know, you can't fix something if you don't even start talking about it and start working towards making a change. Thank you, Colleen. Anybody else? Well, I can just, for my perspective with the grant, I think that uh, the change that we're looking for, I think we need to be really clear and really clear about what it is that um, is a problem 
and define it clearly and identify who are contributors to it and then um, have a community response, not just a law enforcement response, not just a, a parent response, but a whole entire community response to of uh, the problem. And I think that um, by acknowledging the problem, defining what it is and what you what steps you can take to address it, uh, that will start walking us towards uh, some kind of resolution in regards to at least for disproportionate minority contact and racial and ethnic disparities. Thank you, Linnea. Chief, I think you wanted to talk, but you were muted. So you go ahead. Well, I I think we've already hit on it is you've got to recognize that there is a problem and I think we all have recognized that there's a problem um, and obviously work together to solve the problem but don't be short-sighted don't think that if we can't see immediate change in the next six months to a year to a year and a half to give up that's sometimes I think we have a tendency if we don't see immediate results we either feel like we're doing it wrong or it's it's not a problem that we thought it was. Um, but I think we've all identified the problem. And I think the communication and the partnership is going to help us to really dig deep when we do the data dive and get this, this information where we can really dig into it and find out what's at the root of the problem and how we can fix it. We've got to stay committed to it. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's something that's going to be a long term uh, process. And I know I'm definitely committed to it. And I think everybody here is, is committed to it. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's direct. Guys, there is a problem. I think we've done that. And now we're going to work collaboratively to solve it. Thank you, Chief. And I want to remind all of you that are uh, watching right now, if you um, would like to uh, put in a question for any one of our panelists, by all means, please put it in the chat box there on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we've got a couple of more questions, so we'll be on here for, for just another moment or two. But um, by all means, please send in your questions if you have them. Pastor Nick, you look like you have something to say. Um, I, I, I would say the change starts with education, um, starts with knowledge, starts with competence, and starts with respect. And I believe if we have those things in place, um, I believe that we can spark and start some change in our community. Anybody else on that? Um, I guess the, the, the last question that I have, um, because we've talked a lot about experiences and, and each of you have shared what you've wanted to on that, but um, aside from the project, what's next? Where do we go from here? If each one of you could say, okay, thank you, Wayne County. You got it started. Now let's do this. What would we do? I'll start. Okay. I think we have to be willing to have courageous conversations. You know, um, be willing to open ourselves up for you know, looking at our personal practices, our practices within our agencies, and be willing to make that change as we identify but it starts with having those courageous conversations with each other and I think that's where we start I would agree with Colleen I think one of the things that the community can do um, to help us when we um, start in earnest the work on the um, red DMC grant the racial and ethnic disparity disproportionate minority contact grant we're going to be calling on the community to help us. We're going to be calling on you to participate in um, all sorts of things, um, discussions, community events, and involvement. Um, and uh, if I can share this, um, Linnea and Colleen, you all um, have been working earnestly with the um, Lenore County group. And one of the problems that uh, we recently talked about is not having enough white folk in the community participate. Uh, black people like to talk about race because we deal with it every day. Uh, well, perhaps saying like is probably not necessarily apropos, but nonetheless, it's an issue that we deal with and we have to talk about it. Um, and when you get into these kinds of discussions, um, if it's not um, 
um, well attended. Um, you don't get the perspectives from everybody within the community. And so we're going to be calling on the community to participate as we move forward. It'll be after the first of the year, but certainly we are um, um, excited about it and hope that the community will um, buy into it and participate to help make it a success. Uh, and um, I think that's one of the key ways that our local community can become involved. And um, it's really funny, Judge James, but somebody just asked the question, how does some, a member of our community get involved with the project? We'll be calling on you. And, and also reach out to, stay connected with um, various community organizations. Um, you know, um, and this is one of the ways that um, social media is helpful because if you um, go on to um, the County of Wayne page or the City of Goldsboro page or GPD um, or any of those groups, um, some of the other groups who are connected with this, the um, community supporting schools, the local NAACP, um, all of those groups um, are participating with us. And so if you're connected to them, you will likely find out and um, get information about what we're doing. We're going to try to push it out to the community in other avenues and other ways as well. But um, stay connected and stay involved and uh, we'll be contacting you. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to weigh in on what's next, what we do? Carol, I'll just say that I'm excited about the uh, grant that the chief and his uh, department applied for from the law enforcement side. We will definitely be supporting uh, Goldsboro in any way we can on that. Uh, as been said already, education is key. Uh, UN50 is a fantastic program to integrate into our community, uh, our school system. As already been said, education is the key. And uh, as long as we can teach people to Respect each other has already been said also. I think we're going to make a lot of progress here. I just want to say thank you to all of them. Thank you very much, Sheriff. And um, BJ, I do want you to tell people um, if they're interested. Uh, you know, we started working with you. Judge James was there the day that um, I first learned about you and your program, you and 5 I have never been so blown away by a message and a directive and common sense and something, uh, yeah, I'll be honest, I grew up in a military family. We didn't know race. John Bell, our commissioner who passed away in March, he and I used to sit and talk about that. And he said, you know, uh, the whole time I was in the military, he said there, there was no race. And I said, you're right. That's how we were raised and that's how you uh, dealt with it as an, an NCO in the Air Force. Um, but that's not reality, you know. I'm fortunate. I didn't have to think about race, but as Judge James said, talk with a black person, they do every single day. Talk. I spoke with a uh, Hispanic employee of ours, and um, he could not have thrown racism for him in my face any stronger than by asking me to picture what Mary Jones looked like and then to picture what John Jackson looked like. And then he looked at me and he said, Jose Hernandez. That, that was a very poignant moment. So um, anybody that wants to, to uh, learn about your program, please, BJ, share how they can do that. When we first met, you talked about the fact that you don't have to worry about and because of that's just not the space that you move in. So I think um, UN50, uh, UN50.com, my website, they can do there on my Facebook page and keep up with that. We have a podcast. Um, I think I want to get back to the, the part about the change. I think what I'm hoping will, will happen is that when people start coming through and having these especially with you and five on interaction with law enforcement is to get involved with with your law enforcement community and talk to them find out what they're doing 
Um, they're willing to be sitting at the table uh, because you got to have the conversation. You know, it's okay to, to, to be mad at the popo sometimes, but you really need to figure out what is it that you want from your law enforcement agency. Let's have this candid conversation and, and let's talk about it. What I'm hoping that we get through doing this is that uh, that not the conversation for you and 5 is not necessarily that you have to like the police officer, you just have to respect to get to the house. That's what we want to do. But we also want you to be involved in the relationship with, with your local law enforcement. Find out what it is you want and what you want your law enforcement officers agency to look like. And Chief West and the sheriff, they, they're, they're already, you know, their conversations and how they're talking about it. We got to do it together. We, we have to be at the same table uh, with everybody. So for me, I'm looking forward to working with the community. I'm looking forward to working with Chief West and, and Sheriff Pierce. So thanks for the interview. Thank you, BJ. Is there anything else at this point in time? I think uh, we've answered all the questions that have come across. There have been some comments. You'll be able to go back and look at those. Um, is there any final comment that any one of you want to make before we close out this town hall? One comment that I'll make, and, and I would invite the public, because we're going to be reaching out to the public to get involved uh, in this when we get running with it. They can certainly email me at the police department. Um, my email address is on the our website, so you get definitely in, in email me if you're interested in participating in this. And as we move forward, we'll you know we'll work towards that. But um, I had a couple of opportunities to see the program that uh, BJ puts on, and, and I wasn't able to make it, but I will say that I will be virtual. Uh, in the virtual classroom Thursday. Uh, I'm looking forward to being a part of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is this is this is a community effort. You know, the police department and the sheriff's office and the schools are going to be behind the scenes working it and getting it together. But yeah, it's definitely a community thing, and I think very optimistic about it, very uh, committed to it, and I think it's going to be a great thing for the community. We just got to stick at it and, and keep moving. Thank you, Chief. If you guys are doing anything that involves um, the use of the religious community, um, I've been really blessed to have a pulse of a lot of the pastors here in our city. Um, I built wonderful relationships with about 95% of the pastors here in our city. So if you need us for anything, um, please, uh, I got you. I see you. I see your hand. Uh, please reach out to me and uh, let's make it happen. I'm actually, I'm actually, because when I did U9 Wayne, uh, we had about five to six hundred people at City Hall uh, who came together, um, and so we, we, we're at the pulse of the religious. I'm blessed to be at the pulse of the religious community here in uh, my county, and so um, let's make it happen and. Um, let me know how I can help in any way. Linnea's excited. <laughs> I'm very excited. <laughs> um, please, anybody and everybody, we really do welcome all conversation. Um, the more, the merrier. The bigger the table, the bigger the voice, the bigger the impact. Um, I really do believe in having as big a table as possible and that all voices are important. All voices are important. Uh, so, and if people want to reach out to me, um, I'm at Southeast Community Resources, and I'm on Facebook, so people can like me and send a message if you like, and um, we'll be looking forward to meeting with everybody virtually or in person at some point, hopefully, uh, in January. And thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you, Linnea. You're welcome. Anybody else? Well, I'm going to look directly at you, all of you right now, and then I'll look at the uh, other camera that I'm supposed to to close out. But uh, let me just say, Judge James, Linnea, my friend BJ, who I absolutely just have the utmost respect for, as I do the rest of you, but she's just one of the coolest chicks I've ever met in my life. Colleen, Sheriff, Pastor Nick, and Chief each and every one of you took your, the time out of your lives to come and do this, to start the conversation that Wayne County needs. And every one of your comments, your insight, and your real 
truth tonight, um, I hope goes a long way to continue the conversation. I hope there's a hundred conversations that branches off of this one tonight, sometime tomorrow morning around a water cooler. Um, but I thank you all very, very much and we'll be in touch. We'll be doing something else with all of you for certain. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Again, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. It has been, um, it's, it's been a first for Wayne County, but we hope that it's been refreshing and real. And even though it may have been uncomfortable, and we hope it was, but because you cannot change, you cannot grow, and you cannot heal until you hurt first. And so we hope that this has been the beginning, getting past that hurt, getting past that anger, and that we are healing and changing right here in Wayne County. Thank you for joining us, UN50 Real Discussion. Thank you.